Humans are meant to age. However, we are not meant to age the way most of us are currently aging. I think we've forgotten what natural aging even looks like. What does natural aging look like? So when I think of natural aging, I think of, and you look at basically how the um, life expectancy has increased every decade, which is a huge success, but the problem is the quality of life. Right. And unfortunately, really traditional medicine is so focused on lifespan that I would argue that the vast majority of physicians, if you say, well, what do you think about health span? they'll have no idea what you're talking about. The damage has been done, right? I've already, I've gotten too much sun damage, too much scarring, too many years of, of not doing anything. Do you really believe that it's never too late to stop the aging process? Oh, it totally is. Our body is meant to rejuvenate itself. Mm. Our body has natural regenerative abilities that if we call on it to do that, it will function in that manner. So the way I look at it, it's like you're building a house. And some people come in to see me in my office, say, hey, Dr. Ian, I want a facelift. Here's, you know, I've got money in hand, I want a facelift, I want to look 10 years younger. And it's like, oh, wait a minute here. The way I look at it, like I said, it's like building a house. And like the facelift, the actual surgery is like the spire on top of your house. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The food you eat is gonna be the, the foundation. That's what's really gonna be the foundation of your whole, of all of your aging. My name is Dr. Anthony Yoon, and I'm known as America's Holistic Plastic Surgeon, and this is Ever Forward Radio. Uh, well, Tony, welcome to the show. Officially, we'll jump in here. Thank you so right. much, Chase. I appreciate it. You know, I, I love what your work, what, I, what I'm looking at your work as this amazing blend of real world being a human, what it's like to, to, to live and die on planet <laughs> Earth kind of thing with the medical model and this whole concept of holistic plastic surgery, which I really want to get into. Mm -hmm. But around your new book and just what I see so much of your content focusing on now it is aging, mm -hmm. but resilient aging. And you have this great quote I want to start off with, I yeah. think is a great primer for the reader as well as for the listener here today. Humans are meant to age. However, we are not meant to age the way most of us are currently aging. I think we've forgotten what natural aging even looks like. What does natural aging look like? So when I think of natural aging, I think of where my ancestors came from in South Korea. And I look at my grandparents and, you know, when they aged, they were active their whole lives. And then at some point when they, they get to a point in their lives where they literally will unfortunately die fairly quickly, but they get to like 87, they get to 90, they get to 95 and they're active, they're walking, they're eating, they're having fun, they're enjoying their life. Mm -hmm. And then something happens uh, where their life ends. That is very different than what we're seeing in the Western model of aging, very, very. where it's this kind of gradual decline to the point where our actual healthcare system is propping us up. Hmm. You know, how many people do you know who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they're on so many medications? You know, they, they really are not active. They've got constant aches and pains. Yep. 30s, and 40s, 50s, I know people. Yeah, and then they're undergoing mm -hmm. interventions to essentially keep them alive. Mm -hmm. And the medical system, you know, I, I did all my training, you know, traditionally, I did three years of general surgery, I mm -hmm. did two years of plastic surgery, I did a, a cosmetic surgery fellowship. So I'm fully trained in everything. I've worked in the ICUs, mm -hmm. and it works really well when you're really sick, and it can really help prop us up. And you look at basically how the um, life expectancy has increased every decade, which is a huge success. But the problem is the quality of life right. is yeah. a whole different story. And that's that thing that you've talked about on the podcast yeah. before. You know, there's health span and there's lifespan. lifespan and right. they are two very different things. And unfortunately, really traditional medicine is so focused on lifespan mm -hmm. that I would argue that the vast majority of physicians, if you say, well, what do you think about health span? They'll have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, and so for me, you know, coming from traditional medicine, um, I went through a period of time where that's what I practiced and that's what I preached actually mm. to my patients. And then I came to a realization that this is not really the way to go. Mm. I'm curious, what would be your definitions of health span and lifespan? So lifespan essentially is how long you can live. And once again, our traditional medical system is great at extending our mm. lifespan. But at what cost and what quality of life are you having in those last 10 or 20 years? Health span is the amount of time that you're alive, that you are active, that you are healthy, that you are enjoying life, that mm. you are truly living a, a life that's fulfilled. 
And that, once again, is something that you can have for a very long time, but you cannot, unfortunately, do that if you're living in today's society under today's rules, under today's diet, yeah. you know, what people do for activities, stress level. So much of what we have in our lifestyle today is, is a net negative when you look at <sighs> overall health span. Too true. Too true. Um, it kind of brings to mind for me Blue Zones. Are you familiar? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, Dan Butner's work, if, amazing book, The Blue Zones. Uh, I saw him speak at a conference, actually, my undergrad, my first semester of my undergrad program 10, 11 years ago now. Um, and I was blown away. I was like, why aren't more people talking about this? Yeah. Now there's a little bit of a resurgence, I think, thanks to a lot of people like, you know, your work, Huberman, Peter Atia. Yeah. Gabriel Lyon of this longevity aspect. And I see a resurgence in his work. There's a new Netflix documentary out yeah. around oh, the yeah. blue zones. And it was so powerful to me. And so kind of such a, a positive reminder of what end of life can, if not even should look like, and you exactly. hit on a couple of key words, health span, lifespan, but movement. And, and I think you said happy you know, people in these blue zones that are having higher and longer quality of life and living longer, they're smiling, yeah. they're with other people, and they're moving. Yeah. Maybe not a particular blue zone, but do you, as an MD and a holistic uh, plastic surgeon, do you look at a particular type of, of, of group of person, like in a particular region, ethnicity, culture, as like, hey, this is a great example of what we're talking about of where health span and lifespan kind of come together? So yeah, I think if you look at the blue zones, the obvious choice for me, being Asian American would be the Okinawa is one right, of those. Right. Now, being Korean, um, you know, <laughs> we grew up, Japanese were not necessarily kind to Koreans mm. over the centuries. <laughs> um, so for me, I do look at South Korea, you know, because for me, that's kind of, and, and it, plastic surgery is a whole other story. We can talk about that later. Um, but really, I think when I look at it, I look at the lifestyle mm. of my parents and my grandparents and how even that has changed as they have brought their children or they have raised their children here mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. States. You know, I grew up in the middle of Michigan uh, in a blue collar, meat and potatoes, fast food, small town Michigan. And it was an interesting dichotomy because- It's a little different than Korea. Yeah, because <laughs> my parents literally immigrated and came straight essentially to yeah. Michigan and they barely spoke English, you know, and, and it was this weird situation where we we're the only Korean family, the only real, um, at the only ethnic family, non-white family, essentially in town, and how how do you get through that as a kid? Mm -hmm. You kind of want to be everybody else, mm -hmm. and so for me, like my diet, for example, consisted of either going out with my friends and eating McDonald's, or I would have Korean food at home, mm -hmm. which would be rice, fish, kimchi, so fermented foods, wow. lots of garlic, like all this. Great healthy foods, but some then, of my favorite foods. <laughs> but then on the other side, it's like you go out with your friends, and and our American small town society there was built off of essentially mm. meat and potatoes and fried foods and all of that. So yeah, so for me, when I look at it and I look at longevity, the first people I look at mm. are my parents and my grandparents and the people who came, you know, from that part of the world because there are so many um, practices that that they employ that I think we could learn from. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, mm -hmm. I've, I've been making these videos lately, so I've got a big following on TikTok and Instagram. Big stuff. TikTok guy, everybody, <laughs> check him <laughs> out. It's kind of funny. Great, great um, videos. But I started making these videos on how to age like an Asian. Yeah. And I thought it's kind of funny because <laughs> a lot of it's true and a lot of it's just kind of silly over the top <laughs> stuff. But it is, a lot of it is really true yeah. um, of a lot of things that they do. And, and they did it not necessarily that they knew. You know, I mean, eating Kimchi is like mm -hmm. a staple of the diet, being essentially what that is, fermented cabbage with hot sauce. Right. You know, I ate it growing up every day almost, and I never thought, oh, I'm adding probiotics to my microbiome. It was just a regular staple of your food, of your family, not necessarily connecting the dots of, hey, I'm doing this for my skin health or no. anti-aging. And as you get older, you start realizing like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of these things that we were doing that were really good for us, and we didn't even realize mm. it. And you know, why is that the case? You know, it, it's, that's a whole other story. That is, that is yeah. definitely, you guys got to check out the blue zones. We want to learn more about that. Um, you talk about how it's never too late to reverse the aging process. I think mm -hmm. that's a statement that caught me off guard. It catches a lot of people off guard. The damage has been done, right? I've already, I've gotten too much sun damage, too much scarring, too many years of, of not doing anything. Do you really believe that it's never too late to stop the aging process? Oh, it totally is. And there's so many examples of, so our, 
our body is meant to rejuvenate itself. Mm. Our body has natural regenerative abilities that if we call on it to do that, it will function in that manner. So just for example, you know, as a surgeon, I still operate two, three days a week. And if I get a patient who comes in who's a smoker, they've been smoking for 20 years, okay? Now, th the main reason why we don't operate on smokers is because smoking will constrict blood vessels. Mm. Uh, if your blood vessels are so constricted that you do not have enough blood supply to a part of the body to heal it after surgery, it can become necrotic. It can literally turn black mm. and it can die. As a plastic surgeon, I do a lot of, let's say, breast lift surgeries. I do a lot of facelifts. I do a lot of tummy tucks where we elevate the skin for these parts of the body and we cut off a lot of that blood supply. And if mm. there's not enough blood supply to heal that, to, to supply that body part, literally it dies, it gets infected, and everything essentially falls apart. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is that when you have somebody who's a lifetime smoker, if you take them off smoking for about four to six weeks, that's enough time. As long as they're off, they're not cheating or anything, that's enough time for those wow. blood vessels to reopen up, even if they've been smoking for 20 to 40 years. So a month or two of not smoking can get someone ready to be in a better recovery To the essentially place. the same place recovery-wise, you know, the tissue recovery-wise wow. is somebody who was a non-smoker all their life. Wow. You know, our body does have these regenerative abilities. It's just we have to call upon it to do that. Um, and so, yes, I do believe that it's never too late to reverse aging. There are mm. so many things that you can do with dot with, you know, and, and the way I look at my book, it's kind of four pronged attack, technically five, you know, it's what to eat, when to eat, mm. it's supplements, skincare, and then, um, and then it's kind of, uh, alternative treatments if mm. desired, that if you call on your body, you do that, you call on your body to use its own regenerative abilities, you can see some really profound impacts. And so you don't have to go under the knife. You don't have to go under the needle. It's just using your body's own regenerative abilities. And that's what I call auto-juvenation. Right, is, right, yeah. Is using your body's own regenerative abilities mm. to literally rejuvenate itself. And it will. That's yeah. the crazy thing. It's like, uh, I'm sure you'll hear this soon when you um, when you talk with them, but it's like my man Sean Stevenson always says, if we just stack the conditions in our favor, yeah. the body will not only just survive, but thrive. Yeah. It, it wants so much more than just homeostasis. Yeah. Uh, and it can actually undo a lot of the damage that we choose to do to it. Yeah. It's just the, pro the problem is, is that our society is so filled with these negative influences mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's tough. I mean, now, you know, I'm, I've got high school age kids and it's like, hey, you know what? I don't see hardly anybody that smokes anymore, mm -hmm. but everybody's vaping. Everybody's vaping. And so you, there actually was a study that looked at the effects of wound healing comparing smoking to vaping. Even if you didn't vape nicotine and you had similar negative impacts in wound healing with smoking versus vaping. And once wow. again, even if the vaping wasn't even nicotine, like what is it with that? We don't just even know. the inhalation process. Just in we don't know if it's the chemicals that are in those liquids that you are heating up to these high temperatures. Interesting. You know, is it some people, there, there's a lot of hypotheses. Some people say it's even some of the plastics that are in these devices that may even start to break down. Oh, yeah, microplastics, that's... That's a whole nother episode. We don't know, but yeah. even even if you don't have actual nicotine in your vape, it still Jeez. impacts wound healing the same way. Wow. Um, and so you add that with some of the other things that we haven't even studied, you know, with marijuana smoking, mm. so many people now smoking marijuana. We don't know. We do know the impacts of cigarette smoking being, being such a huge net negative mm -hmm. for our health span and even our lifespan. We're, we're learning what the effects of marijuana might be, but even with my patients, wow. I tell them, look, Marijuana was illegal for so long. We don't have any studies on it. So we don't know if it's going to constrict your blood vessels. We don't know, is it going to prematurely age hmm. you five, 10 years from now? You know, I see patients who come in to see, my, to see me in my office, and literally within a few seconds of looking at them, I can tell you that they're, if they're a smoker or not. Oh, I bet, I bet, I can yeah. tell you their diet. I can tell yeah. you, kind of, you know, how active they are. I mean, it's, it, it all shows Damn. up in the skin. Wow. So you kind of already hit on it, talking about, you know, kimchi and your upbringing. Let's focus on diet for anti-aging. Yeah. What is so crucial about our diet? Not meaning, not necessarily I abide by this particular diet, yeah. but the food that I eat on a regular basis. What type of influence does that really have on our skin in terms of aging or anti-aging? So the way I look at it, it's like you're building a house. And some people come in to see me in my office, say, hey, Dr. Ian, I want a facelift. Here's, you know, I've got money in hand. I want a facelift. I want to look 10 years younger. And it's like, oh, wait a minute here. The way I look at it, like I said, it's like building a house. And like the facelift, the actual surgery is like the spire on top of your house. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The food you eat is going to be the, the foundation. That's what's really going to be the foundation of your whole, of all of your aging. And so the way that I look at it is everything really is based upon that. Now, when I look at overall aging of the skin, you know, and longevity is a little bit different versus mm -hmm. actual aging of the skin. 
and premature aging, I look at really five main issues that can occur causing our skin to age more quickly. The first thing is nutrient depletion. Mm. Second thing is inflammation. Third thing is uh, oxidation or free radicals. Uh, the fourth thing is collagen degradation. And the fifth thing is buildup of cellular waste. When you look at all of these things, what you have to eat impacts pretty much all of right, them. Right, yeah. Uh, and Diet so, influences everything you just said. Exactly. So now you may talk, to, so if you say, hey, I want to look younger, and you talk to, let's say, an alternative health practitioner, mm -hmm. you say, hey, what, what should I do for younger, better looking skin? And they'll be like, oh, you got to heal your gut. Mm -hmm. Heal your gut mm -hmm. and your skin's going to be better. Mm -hmm. And you talk to dermatologists, you go, hey, what should I do for younger, better looking skin? They go, wear sunscreen and use a retinoid. And then you talk to a plastic surgeon, they'll go get laser treatments and a facelift. <laughs> and really the truth is, ideally, like in so many things in life, it's combining sure. the best of all worlds, that's going to get you the best result. And so food being really the basis of mm. all of this and eating the right types of foods can impact all those five main causes of aging of the skin. Mm. And at the same time, not eating the right foods can impact all five of those as well and cause you to age more prematurely. Let's go there. Can you give us maybe a couple of foods that you think most people or a lot of people are under consuming or not eating at all that are actually a disservice to their skin health? Yeah, so for example, if you look at these aging, aging causes, uh, inflammation, okay, so what is uh, inflammation, interestingly enough, inflammation can be good and bad. So some people think, oh, inflammation is bad, you wanna reduce inflammation, mm -hmm. period. And that's not necessarily always the case. Acute inflammation mm -hmm. can be a very good thing. So if you get cut, a cut on your arm, you get inflammation around that wound and your body heals it. It has to create inflammation. That's a healthy Without reaction. It, we're not going to heal, right? Exactly. Right. So that's a healthy reaction that will be beneficial. Um, when you get a laser treatment of your mm. skin, that creates inflammation, acute inflammation. Acute inflammation can cause the collagen of the skin to become tighter. It can make mm. your skin actually look younger and act younger and be younger in some ways afterwards. So acute inflammation can be a great thing. We even see now, you know, it's kind of the same idea of people who are doing... Um, uh, cold water plunges and really putting their body under short-term periods of stress. I'm in that club now, that, that annoying club where we just post about it on social media. All the time. <laughs> there yeah. you go. So yeah, I mean, putting your body under short yeah. periods of stress can be a very good thing. It's that chronic mm. inflammation that can be negative. And so when you look at chronic inflammation for the body, what is the number one cause of chronic inflammation, mm. especially when you look at the skin? It's sugar. Mm. Okay, so sugar... Which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, at least not listening to this show, but please unpack that more for us and let's get a good reminder. So a lot of people think of sugar and they go, oh, you eat a lot of sugar, you eat a lot of carbs, you're going to gain weight, you're going to, you know, it's it met metabolically, it mm. makes you unhealthy. But what a lot of people don't realize is that sugar is the great ager of our skin mm. as well. So the, the sugar can impact our skin by causing chronic inflammation in two different ways. The first way is glycation. So sugar can bond to the collagen and the elastin in your skin, causing it to become deformed. So when we look at the structure wow. of our skin, our skin is composed 70 to 80% of collagen. Mm. Collagen is that part of the skin that causes it to feel tight and strong. And you know, when you're young, it's, you've got a lot of collagen mm. and you've got nice, smooth, tight skin. As we get older, we lose about 1% of the thickness of our collagen of our skin every year, starting around in our mid-20s or so. That soon, really? Yeah, so you start wow. losing about 1% a year, Women after menopause lose upwards of 2% a year Oof. after they go through menopause. And that's why you may see women who are in their 70s and 80s and their skin is like tissue paper mm. thin. And if you even just like scratch it against a door or something like that, it's it gonna tears. Tear, yeah. um, and so mm. the first thing we look at is, um, with, is, is you want to make sure that you build up your collagen and you don't continue to lose it. So when you have collagen and it's youthful, it's, it's the way I describe it, it's like the logs of a log cabin. Mm. And those collagen is in, is in these tightly packed logs. It's nice and tight, it's solid. But as we get older, those logs become a bit frayed. They start to fall apart. What sugar does mm. is sugar can then bind to those collagen proteins and it can bind to them causing what's called, uh, creating what's called an advanced glycation end product or an AGE. And essentially what it does is it kinks that collagen and cause it permanently to become deformed. So it kind of creeps into the mortar of our internal of our fortification skin. Yep. of our skin. And instead of the collagen kind of coming in and resetting, the sugar is patching those holes and deforming the structure. Exactly. And that's why one reason why as we get older, our skin feels rougher, it's mm. not as smooth, is because that collagen itself has essentially is wow. falling apart. And so what sugar does is sugar causes that process to go more quickly because it will actually bond to them, creating these sugar protein hybrids called advanced glycation end products. Um, and so 
Sugar will then cause you to prematurely age and to look older the more that you eat it. Mm. The second way that sugar causes our skin to age more quickly is chronic inflammation. And this is something that you've covered before uh, on your podcast. What a lot of people oh, yeah. don't realize, though, is that that inflammation can be seen on the skin mm. as premature aging. So chronic sugar spikes equal chronic insulin spikes. Chronic insulin spikes can create chronic inflammation. You get insulin resistance, where essentially you've got so many sugar spikes that wow. your tissues are not reacting to that insulin anymore. Sugar goes up, you get prediabetes, you get diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and all that stuff that you've covered here before. Somewhere in the Palisades right now, Dr. Casey Means is jumping for joy. Her ears are ringing. <laughs> and you know, the, the funny thing is, so some people say, well, you know, that, that metabolically that's unhealthy yeah. and stuff. But what a lot of people don't realize is that will make you look older. And so I get people that come into my office and you know it's interesting because we all have our own, um, our own uh, 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 what's the word for it? The, the things that drive us that, that cause us to change our Motiva lives, like motivations. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, for some people, like for me, a huge motivator is I want to be alive when my daughter gets married. Like I want mm -hmm. to walk her down the aisle. Other people's motivations may be that they you know want to feel strong or they want to live to a certain age or whatever. Mm -hmm. Some people's motivations. Are they just want to look good? They want to look in the mirror and mm. feel good about themselves, or they want to turn heads or something to mm. that extent. And so there's so many people that come into my office where they're not motivated by some of these other <laughs> things. You may say, well, you know, if you keep eating this way, you're going to die a, an early death, yeah. or you're going to have a heart attack, or you're not going to you're going to get COPD in your lungs if you keep smoking. And they don't care. But if you say you're going to get more wrinkles, like, oh, wait a minute here. So you just got to find that leverage. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's some people. Yeah. And hey, if that's what it takes to change a lifestyle, wow. then hey, I'll, I'm all for it. Um, you were talking about collagen quite a bit. And in your book and so much of your work, you talk about collagen. You, yes. you, you drive that into the ground in a good way. Yes. So I'm curious because I think over the years, collagen has kind of surfaced a lot in, mm -hmm. in the supplement world, but also, hey, get more of it in your diet. I'm curious, what matters more if we put it on externally or consume it internally? So if I put on like a collagen cream or a moisturizer or something like that externally, am I getting as much bang for my buck as like my coffee here, Strong Coffee Company, I'm drinking 15 grams of collagen. I'm mm -hmm. ingesting it, metabolizing it, and then it, it's getting into my body from the inside out. Yes. Is there a preferred method, internal versus external totally. collagen? Yeah. So collagen is a huge protein. It's a large protein. And if you put collagen, a collagen cream on your skin, it will do nothing. Nothing. Because it's too big, because our skin is a barrier and the skin is made, it's made basically to keep out things we don't want in our body. But we want uh, collagen in our body. But collagen is a large protein mm. and it's going to sit on the surface because there's no way for it to actually penetrate through the mm. areas of the skin where maybe if you put, let's say, a topical medication, um, you know, hormone, let's say mm -hmm. a hormone patch where it will go through that. Collagen's too big too. Mm. Okay. So it will not. The reason why- So we're just rubbing it, our money away. You are. So collagen wow. creams, all they do is they moisturize your skin. That's that's it. So I do not recommend spending excess money on a collagen cream. Okay. That's BS. So you can get moisturized skin, but you're not really getting collagen benefits in your skin. You It it it, it won't add anything. Damn, all right. Yeah, it's literally like, hey, let's let's put protein on your skin. That's not going to do anything. <laughs> now- Versus going internally. Ingesting it's a whole other story. Mm. Okay, so collagen, once again, it's a big protein. And, and it's fascinating because this is a big- controversy online where, you know, I, yeah. um, is there collagen in there? No, there's not. <laughs> I have actually posted on collagen and saying, you know, I'm mm -hmm. a believer in collagen supplements. Uh, and I've had doctors and other fitness people say, oh, that's BS. It mm -hmm. doesn't do anything. A lot of people, especially in the fitness industry will say collagen is one of the most useless supplements. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that they're totally wrong. So let me explain. So collagen is a large protein. Uh, and the, and the reason why people say that it doesn't work is because it's such a large protein, you ingest it, it gets broken down in your stomach. You go, how do you even know it's going to get to your skin? Um, so the fact is, if you're going to get a collagen supplement, you should get hydrolyzed collagen peptides. Mm -hmm. So what is that? Well, essentially, you take that collagen, large protein, and you break it down into individual peptides and amino acids. Amino acids are the individuals. Peptides are a group of mm -hmm. amino acids, usually a small number of them. The reason why they call them hydrolyzed, the reason why they break it down in that is so that you can actually absorb it. And so uh -huh. your intestine can actually, your, your gut can actually absorb that. So, so that's you know, a key word we should be looking for. Hydrolyzed any collagen. collagen. Okay. Yes. So that's the idea behind hydrolyzing collagen is you break that collagen, uh, that big protein down into individual mm -hmm. amino acids or into small peptides so that you can absorb it. Amazing. So then what does the science show? 
Um, there are many, many studies that actually have looked at, at uh, hydrolyzed collagen supplements and have found a beneficial effect, especially on the skin. So for me, that's what I look at. I look at skin. I haven't looked at, let's say, muscle or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or even joints, although there are a lot of anecdotal stories there. Um, but when you actually look at the skin, there was a meta-analysis published in 2021 of 1,400 people. They took 90 wow. days of a hydrolyzed collagen supplement and found a statistic statistically significant improvement in wrinkles in skin hydration and skin elasticity. Meaning um, like reduction of wrinkles, increase in elasticity. Yes, yes, wow. so statistically significant. There are studies that look at people who take hydrolyzed collagen supplements and they look at them for let's say two months and they mm. actually will biopsy their skin no and way. find an increase in the amount of collagen or the thickness of the skin. You can't deny that. There's so many studies out there. Interesting thing, okay, there's a doctor who's on TikTok. He's an older guy. He's a cardiologist who has got some nutrition training and stuff. And he's um, he looks kind of like Santa Claus. He's got a huge beard, and he speaks very matter-of-factly. You know, it's mm. all about nutrition. And and he's one to debunk claims by everybody. Um, and so he did do a video about a year and a half ago basically saying that collagen supplements are worthless. Just buy some Jello and have gelatin. And it's the same thing. Interestingly, mm. about two, three months ago, I came across a, that video. I'm like, why is this video playing again? All of a sudden, his image shows up and he swats the video aside and he says, I was wrong. Really? I, I re-looked at all the studies and collagen supplements do work. And wow. he said, I was wrong about this. Uh, and all the, the claims I made, don't don't listen to wow. it. Collagen supplements do work. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is a traditionally trained cardiologist. We need more who, of that in medicine, yeah. Yeah, who went public saying mm. that he didn't believe in collagen supplements. And about a year and a half, two years later, whatever, came back around and said, you know what? The 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 data's there and it shows that it works. Hmm. So now Full disclosure, I do have a collagen supplement that we have in my uh my Yoon Beauty line. Amazing. Okay. And so it's, you not only promote it, but you actually have a product. So, and yeah, and so we, it's our top selling supplement. And I cannot tell you how many people mm. who've commented that said, you know, my skin looks better, my hair looks better, you know, my hair is thicker, my nails are stronger. Mm. I have people say my joints feel better. Um, the stories are endless. I mean, yeah. in fact, I was visiting my parents a few weeks ago and my mom was making something for breakfast and she goes, Tony, my hair's gotten a lot thicker. Do you think it's that <laughs> collagen you keep sending me? Mom, <laughs> I've been telling you, come on. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the data is yeah. there. The anecdotal stories are all there. I'm not sure why so many people just don't. Mm -hmm. I, I think that they're just in general in traditional medicine, there is a um, prejudice against any type of a supplement, period. Usually. And I mean, look at all the information and misinformation that has, you know, exponentially grown over the years. People, when they're looking to make a choice to improve their life, they go to the internet, they go to social media, and there's so much combating evidence. You know, this person says absolutely yes, absolutely no. So I think something with collagen, they're probably like either 100% a believer or you think it's it's BS. Yeah, and I think too that there's there are traditional physicians who they just believe, you know, the science from so long ago mm -hmm. and they are not willing to listen to people who may disagree with them. You know, I've for me, you know, I'm open to inform health information from anybody, wh whatever the source is, you know, whether it's a chiropractor or a naturopath, mm -hmm. an MD, a DO. Um, but being a tra trained traditionally, that's not the case with most physicians. Mm -hmm. If I were to, let's say, go to my doctor's lounge in my local hospital, uh, where the doctors will sit and have lunch and say, oh, I was talking to a chiropractor about nutrition the other day. They, it would be met with Snickers oh, oh. and guffaws. If and, they even are brave enough to say that out loud, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, if yeah. You, you can't even, and, and it's just, there's this prejudice in mm. traditional medicine against anything that is not what they consider their evidence-based. Mm. And, and now the what they'll say is, is that evidence-based? That's gonna be the argument, is that evidence-based? Well, mm. what do you mean? And then you show them studies, like, look, there are all these studies. They go, well, I don't believe that evidence. I need better evidence. Yeah. I like, need oh, evidence that supports on. my bias, basically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. One other question on collagen, and then I wanna get into something that yeah. you kind of just prompted. Is there a recommended dosage for collagen? Is there a sweet spot of, of grams for male, female, daily, every other day? Not you know, necessarily because Just they're as long all as we're getting different. It? Yeah, and some some collagen supplements actually are thicker than others, mm -hmm. density wise. And so, what I usually recommend is you know is pick the one that you like the best. You know, so for for us, our Yoon Beauty collagen it has no taste to it. Um, and that's one reason why I like it. There are some collagens out there that do have a little bit of a beefy taste. Yeah, to it. And yeah. Some people like that. It's grass fed. Don't. I can tell. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, but no, I don't know that there is an actual mm. 
specific um, guideline of what you need to have. I think that the thing that's important with collagen, though, is it's mm. not necessarily a substitute for protein. Right. Supplement. Exactly. Because it, it doesn't contain enough of the different amino acids mm -hmm. that you need uh, as a macro, as a protein macronutrient for you in general. Correct me if I'm wrong. Do you know, is, is it a complete protein? Does it have every amino acid? I don't think so. All and the essential think, amino acids? I don't think so either. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. That's why it's good for what we're talking about for skin health. As a pure aches, supplement. Pains, joints, things like that. Yeah, yes, yeah. but I would not necessarily use that as a quote unquote protein powder. It's a good point. A good um, point. And so like if I have one of the big things um, with Younger for Life is we have a, a 21 day jump start, And part of it is uh, a shake every morning. Mm -hmm. And that shake contains a protein powder and a scoop of collagen. Mm. Um, because I think that really... You need both technically. That's a really good point. I hope the listener picks up on that, that if you are consuming collagen in any which way in your diet, it's great for whatever reason you're choosing. But I would I would even go as far as say me personally, don't count that towards your total grams of protein consumption per day, I thinking agree. that you're hitting your numbers. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. And I think most, um, most doctors who are really in the know would agree with mm -hmm. you that that doesn't quite count. It really, it's, it truly is what you call a supplement. Like it's, Hey, right. throw it in. It's a nice little thing to yeah. add in, but yeah. it's not something that's going to take the place of you eating sufficient mm -hmm. amounts of protein every day. So what you prompted in me was, I think something that I always come back to with a lot of guests. And when I look at, you know, I kind of have one foot in the scientific traditional medical world and yeah. one foot in alternative holistic healing and what different modalities I have been in this business, this industry for about close to 15 years now. And I think that is a good enough time to really look at, you know, what was really trending or what the evidence to your point supported eight, 10 years ago. And it kind of seems to kind of go in circles a mm -hmm. little bit. One year, one decade, absolutely yes. The next, absolutely no. Or there's too much combating evidence. Do you think when it comes to keep it on topic here with with aging, skin health, resilient aging, lifespan, health span, is it really just a matter of the science catching up to what people are doing in terms of nutrition, in terms of topical, internal, external collagen, things like that, to really get the supporting evidence? Or are we just constantly trying to retest things to get a, a different answer? No, I think it's your the first, you know, because when you look at it, I mean, who are the people who are on the cutting edge of a lot of these um, really anti-aging or um, pro, you know, increasing your, your health span? Those are the biohackers out there, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they're just trying anything. Yeah. The fact is, is that if you're going to do an actual study, an IRB-approved study, okay, and you're going to have a placebo-controlled clinical trial, and you're going to eventually publish it, it takes years to get there. You know, what, I've what published, about like a decade for a good um, one? I mean, it depends on how long you do the study for. for. Like clinical human trials? But for example, yeah, yeah. So for example, I have published many um, scientific, uh, uh, um, scientific papers and articles in our literature I would say if you're doing, let's say, a three or six month trial, mm. it's going to take you a good six to 12 months just to get that IRB approved. So have it approved by the ethics boards and all of that. You cannot conduct a human trial without getting it approved by ethics boards first. And typically mm. those are associated with different universities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's the first step you have to do is you have to create the the, the uh, study. Then you have to get it approved by an IRB um, by an IRB so that it is um, ethically approved so that you can actually experiment essentially on humans. What, for us? Um, it's the inter it's like the International Review Board or something uh -huh. like that. But um, essentially a, what a it governing is, body, it's basically. it's a governing body, typically either at universities or based usually at hospitals or universities where they will look at your study mm -hmm. and make sure that it's safe to perform on a human. Okay. Um, because there Which are, is a good thing. Yeah, because there <laughs> could be ethical issues right. there where, um, so for example, let's say you have a life-saving medication and there are people dying from this disease all over the place and your trial you know, is going to go too long and you're mm -hmm. going to lose too many lives, then they may say, hey, this is not the right thing. Or let's say you're going to conduct a study and you're doing something that is not good for somebody, you know, they, that can be harmed by mm -hmm. your study, then they may not allow that to happen. So it's, it's a very important part of doing any absolutely, type of clinical absolutely, trial yeah. on humans. Um, so you got that that you have to do, and then you conduct the study, and then you have to then submit the study for publication. And even when you get it accepted for publication, it can take a couple of years mm -hmm. sometimes for it to actually be published because of the backlog. Jeez. Now, what's happening now that's interesting is that there are these open um, forums now online where in order to get around this whole time constraint, there are, are online um, journals now that are mm. publishing. Sometimes the articles are not quite as powerful. They're not quite as groundbreaking, uh, but it's a way to get things out more quickly. 
it's a long answer to your question of, you know, really the, I think what's going on is that people are kind of trying to push the limits. Mm-hmm. People are changing things, but it does take time for that to actually get published and then for people to read it. By then, you're on to the next yeah. thing. Like right, the biohackers right. are yeah. way advanced after yeah. that. I mean, people are just, you know, I mean, alternative medicine, they've been talking about the microbiome for decades. And now physicians are finally talking about over the last just like five years yeah, in traditional right. medicine. Yeah. So it takes a while. It's like a little late to the party, uh, but, you know, hey, I'm glad we're finally here kind of thing. Yeah, but, you know, as a plastic surgeon, somebody who does a lot of interventions, there is importance to some mm-hmm. of that because, you know, for me, I see people who are experimenting with cosmetic treatments on things that I know is just not going to work. Mm. Um, and so there are definitely, you know, it's important to have that scientific method there. Absolutely. Um, but it does slow the process down. Right. And I want to get into um, what you do, you know, under the blade, so to speak, in a second. But you made me think of something else. Biohackers, people that are using wearables. You know, I've got an Apple Watch, yeah. a Whoop here. I, I went years, probably eight years of logging 80, 90% of my meals. So I have a lot of data of how I'm moving, how I'm sleeping, what I'm eating, both quantitative and qualitative. And I'm curious in your medical opinion, if we had enough of us, you know, people who have years of self-collected data, let's say quantitative and qualitative through a wearable fitness activity tracker, smart device, whatever, or you're manually inputting information, Could that get to a point in the scientific community of gathering that data Hmm. and kind of like reverse engineering or going about a clinical study in a different way? I know it's hard to say clinical in the same sentence there because there's so many other various variables. I think what you have to look at when you look at studies is the power of the study. And so there's technically there's a a pyramid Mm -hmm. um, and you ideally want to get to the top of the pyramid that's going to be the highest quality of a study. And the highest quality of study is going to be a prospective randomized controlled trial where you've got a placebo, you've got uh, Gold a control, right. and then Double it's blind. blinded, yeah. so nobody knows what they're getting, and then those numbers are very high. Mm. And unfortunately, with what you're saying, like, you know, yes, you can get you can get data and you can get mm. information that can be helpful, but that's going to be on that lower mm. end of that pyramid. So, and there are a lot of articles that are published like that that are definitely really helpful, mm. but that's where you really do want to keep track. The problem with some of the really powerful studies, though, and, and I think where medicine can go wrong is bioindividuality, is not taking into account bioindividuality and Mm. the fact that there's some people who may react in a certain way that's different than the vast Mm. majority of the population. Traditional medicine cannot deal with that. You know, it's like, oh, if your lab result is in this, you know, this range, then you're normal, period. If biomarker says this, then you are that. Yes. And and that's, I think, a big problem with medicine nowadays is, is that there is no that taking the individual person's symptoms and then bringing that into account. Like maybe they're a high normal, but, you know, on your on your scale that has been tested on 10,000 people. Mm-hmm. But for them, that high normal is actually really high because they have certain sensitivities that, right, that they're not right. accounting for. So yeah. uh, it's interesting that I, I think that the tide is slowly shifting towards combining alternative with traditional medicine mm-hmm. and that's really the way to go and that's kind of the direction for me that I'm going with my practice mm-hmm. and, and that I went with the book and stuff. It makes me curious. Uh, thank you for your input on that. I'm wondering, you know, biohackers unite, you know, if we all pull like, <laughs> if you've got X amount of years or X amount of months of this type of data, you know, hey, let's pull, to, here's, here's a new sample size. Here's a unique population with enough data points to at least kind of maybe extrapolate a few things. And maybe then that group would be grounds for, you know, an actual clinical study. That'd be really interesting. It could be. I mean, all you need really is, is Dave Asprey's numbers. And then that counts for every, I mean, that, that, he's that's, too much. He's that's too like much. 5,000 people just in probably his, his numbers alone. I bet. I bet. Yeah. But you know, even these devices, they give us so much information, you know, like I've been using whoop for about four years. It's mm. a physical activity tracker that tracks, you know, during day, during sleep, when I'm training yeah, yeah. recovery. And I mean, what it can provide, yeah. like I'm not even fully tapping into. I just use it for, you know, a daily nudge in yeah. the right direction. You know, yeah, hey, I think that's great. Gas, gas down or gas off kind of thing. But it makes me wonder, you know, hey, if we kind of pulled all our data together, what what could we do? It's a good thought. What could we do? Yeah. And at some point, I think these companies who are, I mean, I'm assuming your data is Aggre- is being aggregated as we speak by a company. And at some mm. point, they're going to do something with that data. <laughs> Big brother, if you're out there, uh, be kind, be kind. And they'll create something to sell, I'm sure, yeah. and, and yeah. make a lot of money off of it. 
Uh, well, I do want to kind of shift into the latter part of the interview here now and talk about, I think, what a lot of people are interested in. Mm-hmm. Maybe they have experimented with or are really curious about. And that's, okay, I'm looking at my diet. I'm looking at these kind of holistic methods. But for my own personal reason, or maybe even a medical reason, I want to spend more money and go under the blade, go under the laser, get a treatment of some kind of variety. What do you think is the... What is the number one treatment you would recommend? Yeah, blanket where, statement where for do most you people. Where do you start? Okay, so I mean, I think the first thing is you start by focusing on the other stuff. So you focus on the diet, and you mm-hmm. really take the recommendations. The, the interesting thing is the recommendations that I give are going to be very similar to what you give for other you know, other types of reasons. Yet that is going to be in general great for your skin. Let, let, let me guess: get good sleep, good yes. quality water, yes, daily physical activity, yes, sunlight, yep. Although not too much sunlight. Not too much sunlight. Yeah, okay, yeah, right, yeah. We'll talk about, we can talk about that. In a certain window. Yeah. And I think with diet, really, it's going to be eating the rainbow fruits and vegetables mm-hmm. because then you're going to target oxidation, you know, the free radicals with that. It's going to be eating healthy sources of protein mm-hmm. um, because you need protein because once again, collagen, 78% of your skin, that's a protein. You got to fuel it with protein. It's not enough just to take a collagen supplement. Um, it's going to also be eating anti-inflammatory foods, okay? Inflammation, like what? chronic inflammation being an issue. Um, so anti-inflammatory foods, I look at two main categories for that. The first category I look at are going to be the healthy fats, so omega-3 fatty acids. So you're looking at cold water fish, mm-hmm. tuna, trout, salmon, mackerel, sardines, that type of thing. Also the monounsaturated fatty acids, so that's going to be like olives, mm-hmm. olive oil, avocados, nuts, and seeds. So really focusing on those anti-inflammatory fats can help reduce that chronic inflammation as you're also reducing the amount of sugar that you mm-hmm. eat. Mm-hmm. But the other group I think that can help, and we mentioned a little bit the microbiome earlier, um, is really supporting the microbiome. Uh, and so eating foods that are fermented that you can then help to support the microbiome. A lot of people know that there's a microbiome, that there's like a gut uh, brain axis, mm-hmm. that the health of the gut will impact the health of the brain, but there's actually a gut skin axis too. Ooh, all and right. so the health of the gut will impact the health of the skin. And so once again, eating microbiome mm. boosting foods like fermented foods, and, and I always recommend a daily probiotic as well, I okay. think is very helpful. So that those are two ways to really help reduce inflammation, and then reducing inflammation by reducing inflammation inducing foods too. Mm. Um, and so those are some things as far as food that I definitely encourage people to do. Like foundational, focus on that, and then kind of come back to what you want to, what maybe you see working or not. Yes. Yeah. And so if you do that, then I always look at supplements too. That's the next step. So the first thing, if you know, I always say, look, start with the food first. Once you're feeling good with that, look into the supplements. We talked about collagen being huge if, as far as if you're looking at anti-aging of the skin. Mm-hmm. And then I recommend some basic supplements. We mentioned probiotics earlier. I think omega-3 fatty acid supplements are great. Um, I also recommend an antioxidant, like a, a combination antioxidant supplement too, okay. just because you can't really get too many antioxidants. And we know we're not getting as much in our food as we used to. Right. Yeah. So nutrient density in food is, that's a whole nother episode as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we look at skincare. Okay. So before you start looking at interventions, I always encourage skincare because you can get profound. If you combine mm-hmm. those first three things, what to eat, we can talk about when to eat in a little bit if you want. Um, and then supplements and you combine that with skincare the vast majority of people can get such a nice change in their skin wow. that they don't need to get laser treatments. They don't need to get Botox or any of that type nice of stuff. Nice being what? They, they look youthful, you could get You can wrinkles. look five to 10 years younger, potentially. Wow. You give it a good you know, three to six months by focusing on those four things, and you can make some huge changes. Wow. We actually have in my book, it's a 21-day jumpstart where we cleaned up the diet. Okay, so literally 21 days, okay, where we clean up the diet, we focus on those foods we just talked about, um, we had them intermittent fast for weeks two and three, just two days a week. We had them uh, take those basic supplements we just mentioned, and then a very basic skincare plan. We put them on it for three weeks, and the amount of changes that we would see in literally three weeks wow. was fascinating. It was astounding. What do you mean by very basic skincare routine? Um, so basic skincare routine, if this is something that anybody can do. It literally takes two minutes, okay, a day, um, and it will cover pretty much whatever you need, mm. okay? So the first thing is you cleanse your skin in the morning. You wanna use a cleanser appropriate for your skin type. So if you've got oily skin, then you wanna use like a foaming type of a cleanser. Mm-hmm. If you've got really dry or sensitive skin, then you wanna go with a more milky or hydrating cleanser. Uh, Interesting. After that, you wanna use a vitamin C or an antioxidant serum. Usually vitamin C is the most common one, okay? Uh, antioxidant serum, you know, antioxidants fight free radicals. Oxidation is one of the agers of our mm. skin. 
Ideally, you want to eat the rainbow of fruits and vegetables so that you can tackle that, that oxidation from the inside out, but you can apply that to the surface of your skin to tackle it from the outside oh, in. So unlike collagen, we can actually use topical treatments here and yes. focus internally through nutrition. Yeah. So now the vitamin C serum is not necessarily going to change the, mm. the internal you know, uh, architecture of your skin, but what it's going to do is it's going to fight off free radicals so okay. that um, the pollution in the air... Uh, the foods that you eat, you know, eating uh, fried foods that those contain free radicals, mm. those will attack your skin. So it will help protect your skin. Vit the antioxidants do. Okay. So you apply an antioxidant serum. Vitamin C is the most common one, and most skincare lines have it. Here's a little tip, like a biohack tip: if you add vitamin E to it, then it's synergistic with vitamin C. So what kind of get, enhances the bioavailability? Um, it actually enhances their antioxidant activity oh, synergistically. Wow, really? Really? So. It's more than just applying two, it's it's even better. So it kind of enhances both. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So vitamin okay. C and E, and there's some that are made with both. Hmm. That's what you want to look at. Vitamin C and E. And then I do recommend a sunscreen. Okay. Now, there's a big question. If you ask a dermatologist, they'll say, even if you're sitting in a basement in the dark watching movies all day, oh, come on. you should put come sunscreen on. on. And then you'll then there are biohackers who'll yeah. say, you know, don't put any sunscreen on and expose your perineum to the sun. You're actually blocking a lot of the potential benefits, you know, getting from Certain yes. types of UV light. Yeah. And I think like like most things in life, somewhere in the middle is probably what makes the most sense. Yeah. I think that you can definitely, I mean, I live in Michigan. Mm. It is so therapeutic in the wintertime when the sun comes out and you have it on your face. Mm. There is a lot of benefits to getting sun sunlight and exposure, especially every morning. You know, that will help your circadian rhythms and all that type of stuff. But as a plastic surgeon, I have seen so many people come to my office with skin ca cancers on their face that are horribly disfiguring, you know, where people come in, they go, I have a little dot here. I think it might be skin cancer. They go see a dermatologist, they get Mohs surgery, then they come back to see me and half their nostril is gone. Oh. And it's like, wow, you know? So- And it could, it could have been avoidable just through sunscreen. My, my idol, musical idol, Jimmy Buffett just died of Merkel mm. cell cancer. I mean, of course it's a skin cancer and, and that guy loved being out in the sun. Damn. So, you know, I think that there's a happy medium there somewhere. If you're mm. going to go out in the sun for a prolonged period of time, then I definitely recommend wearing a sunscreen. However, there are keys that there are little tricks of how to do that. Okay. So there are two types of sun, sun of sun protection. There are chemical sunscreens and physical sun blocks. Okay. Mm. Physical sun blocks are made with zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Those are the ones that, you know, I grew up and you'd see like a lifeguard with this white paste on their Just nose. plastered on. Yeah, yeah. And so physical sunblocks literally will block the sun's rays from hitting your skin. Um, and most holistic health practitioners are fans of physical sunblocks because it's not absorbed into your skin. Mm. But the problem with physical sunblocks is that they can create kind of a whitish hue to the skin. And, you know, yeah, if you're Irish and you've got real light colored skin, then it may not bother you. But if you're Latinx, African American, mm. if you're Asian, then it could really change the color of your skin and look kind of pasty. Mm. Chemical sunscreens basically are chemicals that absorb into your skin. And when you get hit by sunlight, they will react with that sunlight to essentially um, prevent it, prevent those UV rays from damaging the DNA of your skin. Mm. Um, but they are literally absorbed into your skin and they can be absorbed into your bloodstream. There are some of them, two of them specifically, oxybenzone and octanoxate that are considered potential hormone disruptors. And so they can mimic the um, hormones in the body potentially, and so they're not something that I would recommend, okay. especially for children. Okay, okay. And those are in sunblocks? Those are sunscreens. sunscreens. Those are chemical okay. sunscreens. Sunblocks typically are considered safe. Okay. But there are other chemical sunscreens that appear to be safe that aren't endocrine disruptors. So that would be avobenzone and mm -hmm. megzoral XL. Um, so there are different chemical sunscreens that you want to avoid, others that you want that, that in general are safe. What I usually recommend is, you know, if you are a person of color and you really don't feel comfortable wearing a sunblock, then by all means wear the sunscreen. Just try to stay away from oxybenzone mm -hmm. or octanoxate. My wife and I are in such polar opposites. She's Middle Eastern. Okay. And she says the word sun and she gets dark. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't need hardly any sunscreen, any sunblock to really, I, I, I think she needs some. Yes. She's, like, she's out there in the sun way longer than I am. And I'm yeah. like, and reapplying, you, you, reapplying. Yeah. And she's like thinking about her first dose. <laughs> so the, the issue is, is the melanin in your skin will mm. absorb the sun's mm. rays. Okay. And she may not get burned, but there's a, U, those are UVB rays but that will burn you. she can still get UV you. damage. But you, she can still get UVA rays, mm. which can cause premature aging and skin cancer. Uh, and so even people who are African-American with dark skin can get skin cancer. 
Um, and so I do recommend it. But for her, she may want to stick with more of that chemical sunscreen. Okay. Um, for your children, we usually recommend the the, the um, sunblocks, mm. the physical blockers, right. because you know we don't want anything messing with their yeah. their hormones and stuff. So am I hearing you correctly that depending on um, your ethnicity, probably you should be looking at a different sunblock or sun lotion. So my, for example, my wife and I probably should not be using the same product. Yeah, I mean, you could technically use her product if, if you want. You, so you could use a chemical sunscreen. Okay. Um, it's just in general, uh, a more physical one is going to potentially be less harmful. Gotcha, okay. Um, but for her to use a physical sunblock, you know, her, it could cause her skin to look pasty and weird. Mm -hmm. And so she may not want that. Gotcha, in which case, okay. then if she wants to use a chemical sunscreen, then use right. one without oxybenzone and octanoxate. Okay. And then for the kids, your kids are going to be probably mm. a combination. Then when they're hopefully young, more her. I would, more <laughs> yeah, probably better. Yeah, yeah. Um, when they're young, I would definitely use the the mineral based the okay. sunblocks because they okay. don't care. The kids are out on the beach and they've you know they got a little pasty. They don't mm -hmm. care. Um, but as they get older, then that's something that's going to be a discussion. And the worst thing are the sprays that have chemical sunscreen in them. And you could see these people at the beaches are spraying their kids oh, don't down. don't tell me that. It's so easy. And they're breathing me? it into their lungs. Oh, and these are potential hormone disruptors. Like if so you've got no that, sprays. put it sprayed into your hand and then rub it on them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you could try telling them to hold their breath, but I know when my kids were young, they're like, hold yeah. your breath. They basically just close their mouth and breathe <laughs> through their nose. <laughs> Damn. Okay. All right. So let me go back to kind of uh, some of the other, you know, thank you for that. Okay. That so amazing. that's just the morning. But, that's a morning thing. There's also a night routine too. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So morning routine, just to summarize, that's it. So cleanse, antioxidant <laughs> serum, uh, and then uh, sunscreen. Okay. At night, cleansing, super important. Okay. You need to get rid of the day's worth of grime, dust, dirt. More important than the morning. Makeup. Yeah. Yeah. If you definitely. had to pick just one, let's say the person's like, If you had to like, pick one, okay. wash at night. Okay. Okay. Um, some people will double cleanse. If you mm. want to um, use an oil-based cleanser first, that can help, especially if you got makeup. And then you want to apply an anti-aging cream. And the one that most doctors recommend is retinol. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Retinol is a derivative of vitamin A. The prescription strength is retin A, mm -hmm. and that's the most studied anti-aging cream, period. Which we can get over the counter now, right? Um, retinol is over retinol, the counter okay. version. Yeah, so retin A is prescription strength. You can only get it through a doctor. Very strong, mm. you know, and unless you've got real thick, thick, oily skin, probably don't really need it. I so would go over the with counter, over the okay. counter retinol. Okay. It does the same thing essentially as uh, prescription strength. It just isn't as strong. Mm. Um, and really, that's all you need. If you want to apply moisturizer on top of that, feel free, but you don't really need anything else. Oh, really? So it's very simple. At night, you cleanse, then you apply the retinol. And if you want to throw a moisturizer on top of it, especially if you live like here in LA where it's real dry, mm. you want to get more moisture, by all means, do that. And then the final thing is, two or three times a week at the most, exfoliate your skin. So some people use like a, a scrub. exfoliating scrub. Mm -hmm. Other people use kind of like a light chemical peel. Or even like some of those uh, hand, handheld devices kind of. Um, those are not as recommended anymore because they're a bit aggressive. Mm. Um, and Maybe so, that's why the one I used to use went out of business. I used to have did. a Sonicare years ago. Yeah, they're, they don't it felt those great. Anymore. It felt great, but yeah, they're gone now. I think those are things that to use that you could use once or twice a week and that would be fine, but people are using it every day mm. and it was too aggressive. Mm. Yeah, that's the problem. But that's it, really. That's two minutes skincare routine, and you know we actually tested that skincare routine on people for two months, and we put their photos, uh, and we actually surveyed people to see how much younger these people look after literally just doing that for two months. As in, they didn't have a skincare routine before, and now yep. this is the one they did. Okay. Yeah, and we found they looked about five years older after, five or younger. Years. I'm sorry, younger afterwards. Wow. Yeah, two months of just doing that. That's really impressive. Yeah. So it's, really it's so that, and that's kind of the whole idea is like, you know, if you change your diet, if you add a little bit of inter intermittent fasting to it, we can talk about that if you'd like the supplements and the skincare. Mm -hmm. Most people, if you do that, you're allowing your body's own auto juvenative abilities to turn back the clock on its own. You're feeling healthier. You're looking better. You've got more energy, <sighs> which is what and, we want. Which and that's all you want. really need. And yeah, if you want to add some other stuff, we can talk about that mm -hmm. too. If you want to take the next step, but most people don't even yeah. need to take that step. Um, I would love to get in there. Let me ask real quick. Hey, Joseph, uh, we're a little over on, are we on time? Yeah. You got a few more minutes? Okay, cool. Um, let's say I want to take it a step further. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm doing all these things. I'm seeing results. Or maybe I just feel like I want to kind of jump to a little bit more aggressive modality. Yeah. I yeah. want to go get red light therapy. I want to yeah. get microdermabrasion. I want to go to the local spa and just, you know, have yeah. a day. Yeah. What would you say for the, the average person, average yeah. level skin, not like major damage here, what would be the best bang for our buck in terms of actually doing something beneficial for our skin and anti-aging? 
Yeah. So the first thing that I would look at would be red light therapy. That'd be the mm. easiest thing. Uh, so red light therapy, the idea, now it's interesting because holistic health practitioners are all about red light therapy and traditional dermatologists, plastic surgeons don't know anything about it. Really? Like it's not part of our armamentarium at all. Wow. So red light therapy can come in a lot of different forms. There are handheld devices, which are kind of a pain because you got to put it up to your face and then move it every couple of minutes. You got to prop it up face. and kind of hold it. Yeah. Yeah. There are tabletop devices I think work pretty well where you just have your face in it. And then there are masks that you can wear around that look real creepy. Very creepy. It's like very Hannibal Lecter-ish. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, definitely. <laughs> whatever. Um, and then there are even done. beds. So really the science behind it is still mm. a little bit murky. We think that that red light therapy essentially helps to power mitochondria and mm. mitochondrial function and ATP production. Mm -hmm. Um, we, Simulate more blood flow. Yeah. So the idea, and the same thing when you're looking at thinning hair right. and, and with low light laser therapy for thinning hair, the idea is that the energy of those lasers, they don't create heat. They just create energy. They just have energy without heat, essentially, mm -hmm. can get transferred into that body part. And so for red light therapy for aging of the skin, the idea is that that energy can help to power the mitochondria, mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cells. That's and a good thing. Making them work better. Very good Making thing. the ATP production uh, improved. Uh, we use that for the hair as well. And the idea is that that can help the hair to grow into a growth phase <clears throat> and so can stimulate growth of the so hair meaning too. meaning if your hair is thinning or you're in a hair loss situation, red light therapy might stimulate hair growth again for you? Exactly. Yeah. And there are devices now that are actually helmets that you can put on. I do that myself every other day. No way, really? Uh, yeah. Hair and looks great. <laughs> that, well, that's one reason why. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, but that's another way. It's the same kind of idea. Okay. Um, now, when you look at red light therapy, though, specifically for aging, there have been some studies that have looked at it. There was a study that looked looked at, I think it was like 1,100 people. It was 90 days, and they found 90% of people had an improvement in the skin tone, and 80% of the people had an improvement in the skin smoothness, the smoothness of the skin after 90 days. Two pretty big wins. Yeah, yeah. There was another one where you did, a, this is even better, a split face study, where you have half the face treated, the other half not treated, twice a day for 90 days, and they found a significant improvement in wrinkles in hydration and elasticity of the skin. Same person just down the line. Down yeah, the yeah, you treat half the face. I hope they're paying them well the for that study. the other half you don't do. Well, oh, then you man. do the other half later just after you find the out. results. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is so, so wild. 90 I, days. That's crazy. Yeah, twice a week, 90 days, improvement in wrinkles, in um, skin elasticity hmm. and hydration of the skin. So red light therapy does work. But the interesting thing is plastic surgeons and dermatologists don't talk about it. And I'm not sure why. It's just not something that we've ever talked about or we do. Well, probably losing some clients, maybe losing some patients. I mean, I don't know. It's something mm. that you could easily do at home. And so if you're if you're on a budget mm. and you're, let's say, living in an area where you don't have access to a med spa or anything like that, mm. then getting a red light device, ideally, I recommend a tabletop one. Mm. Um, that's, I think, a great place to start. Now, if you have access, though, to a med spa or a doctor or something and you want good bang for your buck, the thing I would look at would be IPL. Uh, IPL stands for intense pulse light. It's similar to a laser, mm. but it's much less expensive. And it's really, really good at getting rid of dark spots or mm. age spots. Um, and so if you've got a lot of excess pigmentation, which we see a lot of times people get in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, a lot of the sun damage that occurs when they're younger starts to really come That's out of skin. Up. Yeah. yeah, and it shows up as uneven mm. pigmentation and blemishes and spots. Okay, IPL is a great way to take care of it. Um, it's no downtime. It's literally just light energy. So some people who are like, look, I'm, I really want to be natural. I don't want to put a bunch of chemicals on my skin. This is literally light mm. energy. That's it. And it, it basically tackles the dark, it, it, it heats up those dark spots, causes them to be destroyed. And within a week wow. they start falling off and it's just light energy. You can't quick. be more natural than it just being light. Amazing. Yeah. It's so funny. We're talking about this literally today as we're recording uh, my episode went live is all about red light therapy. Oh, there's it. Oh, that's Red light great. therapy, photobiomodulation, uh, particularly for applications of recovery, mm -hmm. uh, injury prevention, injury recovery, uh, inflammation, kind of more sports performance yeah. stuff, but a lot of unique uh, points in that for, for mental health, for brain health, gut health. Um, great timing. Yeah. And what you'll see is a lot of these things that are great for one one part of your physiology mm -hmm. can be really helpful for, helpful for others. And so that's one of the things I wanted to put out in the book was, you know, that a lot of these things that you may look at and go, well, geez, I don't really care about that for increasing my energy. But then you're like, well, actually, you're going to look younger. They go, oh, well, in that case, mm -hmm. let's do it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's trying to find once again, what drives you, what motivates yeah. you. Our skin is just one system of many systems. Mm -hmm. So by focusing on one thing, we can, you know, work on that thing that we're after for our own personal goals, but it serves a myriad of other benefits and systems in the body. And it really is a sign of what's going on inside your body. Exactly. And exactly, it really yeah. does show it. And that's yeah. something that we're learning more and more yeah. about. 
Uh, well, I feel like I, I could just go for another hour with you. I have so many yeah. questions. I think I, a lot of questions come to mind that I'm sure a lot of people are screaming at their uh, device right now. Like, oh, what about this? What about that? But maybe we'll have to get you back again. Yeah, but uh, if they want to learn you. more, where can they go to connect with you? They got the book coming out as well. Yeah. So my book is uh, Younger for Life. Mm -hmm. And if you go to autojuvenation.com, we do have a lot of free gifts that we give you, including an extra mm -hmm. recipe book and discounts and all this stuff. So autojuvenation.com would be a place to go. And I'm all over social media. You just need to put, yeah. put Dr. You and you'll find yeah. me. And He's there. He's some of my there. stuff's a little goofy. <laughs> I like to have fun with it. Um, and so my last question to bring it home to the theme of the show is this has been a great kind of light on a unique area of our, of our life, of our wellness. And I want to know how we can keep moving forward in that area, how you say you keep moving ever forward in life. When you hear those two words, what does that mean to you? Yeah, for me, I think the big thing I look at is what fulfills you. And mm. fulfillment for me is gratitude. Mm. And what am I, what am I um, thankful for? Um, and I think it's finding those things that drive your life. So for me, one of the big things that I am thankful for and that I really enjoy that I find fulfillment with um, is dog rescue. Um, mm. And so I put a story in my book about it, but my wife and I are committed to rescuing senior dogs. And so we find, we oh, try man. to find those dogs and we only like small dogs because I, the big dogs get me afraid of sometimes, <laughs> but we get little dogs that maybe are anywhere from 12 to 14 mm. years old that are um, in rescues and that just can't find a home. And so we kind of watch them for a while. And if nobody, nobody picks them up, then we look at no it. No way. Wow. And so in the last six, seven years, we've adopted five dogs um, and the hard thing is that, you know, they, they're not with us that long. Mm. Um, but the great part of it is, is that you are there for them for the mm. end of their life and you make sure that that part of the life is as perfect as can be. Oh, um, so we got a little guy right now, his name is Tiny. He's, um, 14, I think. And he's got a lot of mobility issues mm. and stuff like that. Um, and we're just spoiling him. <laughs> so rotten right should, now. As you as, should. As you should. So, as you but should. it's so great, you know. Yeah. And and it's and it's a blessing to be there at the end of their lives, where it's really painful for us, but we know that, um, you know, that it's the right thing. Mm. And so I think that's the way I look at it, is is what motivates you in life. What do you get fulfillment by? And and try to to, to go by that. And, and for us, that's yeah. one of our big things. So. And here I was thinking you were going to say more collagen, yeah, but <laughs> take a collagen supplement every morning too. That's not bad as well. <laughs> we recently started giving my dog some collagen uh, and oh, a bone, really? bone broth uh, supplement in her food. She's like 12. She's just, uh, like yeah. a 10 pound little terrier mix thing. Uh, we adopted as well. And, you know, we're finding great benefits by supplementing oh, with uh, bone broth, collagen, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, her that skin's be better as well. That's great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, bone broth, I think, you know, interesting, just uh, as an aside, I have friends of mine, uh, Dr. Kelly and Petrucci's big bone mm -hmm. broth doc. There are no studies that show that bone broth helps improve your skin, but there just aren't any studies done. So that's one that needs to be done. Oh, come on. And I believe <laughs> it, if you do the study, I'm sure it's going to come out with positive results. Just it's not there because it hasn't been done. Uh, 